Hello and welcome to this Royal Society Publishing video podcast. I'm Wendy Barnaby and today I'll be talking to Dr. Mim Bauer of the MacDonald Institute for Archaeological Research at the University of Cambridge. Mim and her colleagues have written a paper in Biology Letters about the ancestry of thoroughbred racehorses and the paper is called the cosmopolitan maternal heritage of the thoroughbred racehorse breed shows a significant contribution from British and Irish native mares, which does rather preempt the conclusions of your paper, doesn't it, Mim? But before we get on to that, can I ask you about um, a, con a confusion which I think many of us feel about this word thoroughbred, because we use it to describe the purity of a breed, whereas in fact it is actually the name of a breed, isn't it? No, I, it, exactly. It's it is also a breed of horses, though I think it's used. Um, I think it can be used quite confusingly sometimes. Sometimes um, I think the thoroughbred breed is held up as the most purebred because the breeding records that we have for it go back such a very long way. So most breeds begin their pedigree uh, records around the 1950s, 1960s, some even later than that. But uh, thoroughbreds very unusually go back. The pedigree records go back to the 17th century, which is quite remarkable, really. So your paper is about English thoroughbreds. What qualities do these horses have? Well, they're obviously they're racehorses, so they're bred for speed, and um, the qualities of racehorses have changed dramatically over over time because the nature of racing has changed over time. So uh, one of the interesting things that I found out as I was researching the background for this paper was that ra uh, horse races used to be one-on-one, -on -one, head-to-head, two horses over four miles or more. So a long time ago, horses were not the sprinters that we see today. So nowadays, you expect a horse race to have, whatever, eight, nine horses and, uh, and um, be over a short distance. So over time, thoroughbreds have... Uh, have been uh, developed more for speed than they were in the 17th century where they could do speed and stamina together. So the English thoroughbreds have all been bred from stallions that came from the Middle East? Well, that's yes, that's correct. Um, we have records where um, a few influential um, th uh, horse breeding families uh, imported um, thoroughbred, st well, they imported stallions from the Middle East and uh, uh, Western Asia to, to form the breed and to improve the breed. This was when? This was um, around the um, early 18th century, end of the 17th century, early 18th century. So these were the stallions. How much do we know about the mares that contributed to the breed? Well, frustratingly, very little. Um, although we have records for 78 mares that founded the breed, um, we know extremely little about them. Um, most of the time, they are named after the stallion that sired them. So you get uh, horses like um, Diamond Mare, which is a mare by Diamond. Or in many cases, you just get uh, well, there's one called Sister to Stripling, apparently. So Stripling, the stallion was important, but she was just his sister, nothing of any import. And yet she founded a major thoroughbred maternal lineage. And then we have other mares that are just called a royal mare. And there are two called a royal mare, two separate lineages, two more called Sedbury royal mare, two separate maternal lineages. So very little indeed. But you would say that it's important to know who these mares are. Well, absolutely, because, you know, biologically speaking, we now know that, of course, half the genes come from the stallion and the other half from the mare. So. Um, it, it, can't be, it, it can't be possible that the mares are not important. So you wanted to know about English thoroughbred racehorses and where they came from. So how did you go about it briefly? Because I know it's terribly complicated. Absolutely. Well, um, what we did was to sequence a small part of the mitochondrial DNA genome. Um, we know that mitochondrial DNA is useful because um, it tracks the female stories, the maternal story, because mitochondria is maternally inherited. So we sequenced uh, a small chunk of, of mitochondrial DNA from uh, um, about 200 uh, thoroughbred horses, and we also sequenced uh, the same section from a number of uh, British breeds, including the Fells, the Highlands, and the Shetlands. And then we went and compared this with close to 2,000 
sequences of the same position and length that we found in the public record, part, some of which we were um, responsible for uh, creating previously. Um, and the first thing we did was to, was to draw a network um, which would define um, genetic types. And then we did some sophisticated statistics to compare uh, different breeds and different regional uh, groups of these uh, horses that we were looking at um, to see which fell closest, uh, genetically speaking, to the thoroughbred. And we found that um, almost every analysis we did showed that uh, British um, or European horses fell much closer to thoroughbred horses than to than any of the Middle Eastern breeds that are supposedly um, responsible for the maternal side of the thoroughbred breed as well. So the stallions were brought from the Middle East. Yes, we have we have his good historic records for that. And so they were mated with British and European horses, and voila, this is where our modern thoroughbreds come from. What we think happened is, obviously, racing doesn't come out of nowhere with the thoroughbred breed. We have records for racing happening in London from the 12th century, and people making bets on racing from 15th century onwards. So racing in the UK is a huge thing already by the 17th century. Um, so these imported thoroughbreds are not coming into a vacuum. They are coming into a situation where, where influential British human families have influential British racing horses. And we have historic records which talk about the Norfolk Trotter or the Hobby uh, and the Galloway. These are supposed to be fantastic horses which are all extinct now, so we can't actually study them anymore. But uh, what we imagine happened is that um, people with money imported some shiny new horses um, had shiny new stallions into their already existing studs and they picked out their very best mares which were probably local and they bred these shiny new stallions to their very best mares and that makes sense. Okay now I want to ask you about where this knowledge leads because of course it's very interesting but does it enable us to do or know or study or investigate something that we couldn't before we knew this? Well, one of the things we're interested in doing is, is looking at how thoroughbreds develop into the future. Um, and those people who um, follow racing will, will be aware that um, thoroughbreds are being bred more and more closely for very specific traits. Um, and along with those good traits, come like speed, come bad traits, which includes some very nasty genetic diseases about which we know very little. We know that they are likely to have come into the breed um, sometime between the foundation of the breed in the 17th century and the present day. Um, and we don't know where, which lineages have them and which don't. So it's really a question of being able to improve the horse's health in the future because we know where they came from in the past. It is, and it's all about ge genetic diversity. I mean, that one of the, l the larger picture things is that there are many breeds. Thoroughbreds is just a single horse breed in among a, par a panoply of domestic animal breeds. And most, um, most breeds need to think ahead about genetic diversity and how they ma maintain genetic diversity. And this is something that we understand more and more about now that we're looking at wild populations which are being slowly eroded by modern life creeping into areas where it didn't used to exist. It's our responsibility to make sure that we don't breed them in such a way that, they, uh, that the breed implodes or is not possible to, um, to continue because of birth abnormalities. And there are a number of, of uh, breeds that I can think of that are already in those situations because of a misunderstanding of how the biology works. Thank you, Mim, very much indeed. And thank you for watching. And that's all from this video podcast. Goodbye.